Um, Lord Glenarf, for just a few further questions. Um, you, you told us about the, the convention reflected in the civil service guidance about not having access to um, I I information provided to ministers of a different political party. Yes. Th that same convention presumably wouldn't have prevented you from being given information about what had been done by your immediate predecessors as ministers. Um, no. It was Mr. Finsberg or Lord Trefgarn or whoever it was. No, that, it wouldn't have prevented that at all. Do, do, do you recall whether you were given any particular information about what um, the, the minister, whoever it might have been, um, who'd been responsible for blood and blood products before you, um, what they'd been doing, or, or what decisions or actions they'd taken? Uh, no, except that I picked up the policy that I think it was Mr. Finsberg was doing, and, and we sort of just went along with, with, with that and the advice that officials provided on it. Um, did, did, uh, did you yourself have any access to advice um, from Dr. Gunson, the consultant advisor to the chief medical officer, or, or, or was that, that um, really only available to, to the chief medical officer? I don't think I ever sought advice directly from him or indeed was offered advice from him, although there was, of course, that letter later on uh, when he approached me and asked to meet. I think that's right. That was uh, Professor Bloom, in fact. Professor Bloom, wrong Bloom. professor. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, you, you talked about the medical advisors in the department being experts. We, we, we heard from Dr. Wolford, in, in fact, that although she, as it happens, was a haematologist... Her, uh, but not a, not a specialist in haemophilia care itself. Um, it, it, her understanding of how she ended up in her role was that that was almost, I think, happenstance. Yes. And she wasn't aware what the actual specialities were, the <coughs> clinical specialities were of her own colleagues in, 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 in the, medical, um, uh, the medical hierarchy. Um, did, 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 did you have any particular knowledge of what the, the clinical expertise was of the various... Um, medical officers from whom you were receiving advice? No, I, I was well aware that uh, Dr. Walford was a haematologist, but I s simply cannot recall what the other uh, doctors had specialisations in, although I believe it would be true to say that uh, in general terms they all had a knowledge to some extent about haematology. Why, why was it that ministers don't, didn't attend meetings of expert advisory groups? Was there a convention not to, or a practical impediment? I, 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 I don't know, because it was a group of experts, and the ministers were not experts in that particular field. But just ask you to think next for a moment about the, um, the issue of trying to prevent high-risk donors from donating blood. We discussed in detail the leaflet... Um, and we saw during the course of your evidence yesterday the references to questioning uh, donors about sexual or intravenous drug use history and some, some, the reluctance of regional transfusion directors, as, as I understand it, to go down that route. Do, do you know in, whether any assessment was ever undertaken of the likely impact of questioning donors about sexual or intravenous drug his, history and, and whether that would, in truth, have a knock-on effect on donation? No, I don't know whether that was undertaken. Um, do you know from the, the materials you've seen or your own memory whether any consideration was given to making up any perceived shortfalls in donation through deterring high-risk donors um, by having a public education programme or an appeal for suitable donors to come forward? No, and I'm not, I don't believe that was ever suggested uh, by anybody. Just a couple of further questions on your Scottish role. Very general, I promise. I'm asked to ask you to clarify that the Scottish Home and Health Department was a sub-department of the Scottish office, a kind of mini DHSS for, for Scotland. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And there was an administrative head, as I think you may have referred to, um, um, but, um, and then you were effectively a minister for health and a number of other matters, and then with the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, over you in the hierarchy. That's correct, yes. 
I was effectively his number two, and there were, I think, three parliamentary undersecretaries uh, in, in the department at the time. Um, and then I'm asked you to ask, I'm asked to ask you to clarify this. When you say you were advised that the risk of AIDS was small or very small, can you clarify what risk it was you believed was small? Was it the risk that AIDS was, would be transmitted by blood products? Or, or was it the risk that if it could be transmitted, the prospect of a patient developing AIDS and dying was small? It was more the transmission, I think, uh, that but the transmission more than anything else, that the risk of the in, that, that, that came from the infected uh, extracts in the States was believed to be small and not what might happen should that ever be given to anybody. Do, do, do you accept um, um, that there was a moral and ethical imperative for haemophiliacs to be informed of the risks of viruses from their NHS treatment? I, I, I wouldn't like to say that it was moral or ethical either way, but I, because I go back to what I said earlier, my clear understanding was that the uh, relationship between the doctor who was treating the haemophiliac and the patient was, if you like, sacrosanct. And this was made clear <coughs> in, uh, in some of the papers I've read and indeed I think in earlier uh, um, parts of the inquiry. That was the, um, the, the, the major key relationship rather more than ministers taking a view in my case, whether something was moral or ethically uh, correct. Can I put it then in a slightly different w w way? Um, uh, if it had come to the attention of the department, and this is a hypothetical question, but a number of my questions have been hypothetical. If it had come to the attention of the department or your attention as minister, that patients were not being informed of the risks of AIDS, or indeed of non-A, non-B hepatitis, from their NHS treatment, for which the Secretary of State for Health was ultimately responsible for that treatment. Would that have caused you concern and, and made you want to at least make further inquiries and, and potentially consider what steps could be taken? Yes, I think it would. That would have been something that I would have wanted to inquire up the uh, medical chain of command uh, uh, as to what the what, what doctors thought about it, but um, uh, I understand that it's a hypothetical question. Um, l last two questions, um, Lord Glenarthur. Um, did you ever, during your time in office at the department, meet any haemophiliacs with um, with bleeding disorders? Any in, or, well, sorry, any haemophiliacs or others with bleeding disorders? Not that I'm aware of, unless somebody who was a member or attended on behalf of the Haemophilia Society uh, suffered from that affliction. And did you ever visit any haemophilia centres or meet with any haemophilia clinicians during your time in office? I might have done, but I don't have any particular recollection. I could only look through my diaries to see if I did. And th those are the questions I'm proposing to ask. I'm just going to turn to, to your representative. No, there's no questions from your representatives. Uh, Sir Brian. Well, I, I have uh, just two uh, areas of, of question for you, if I may. Uh, what, one which looks at your uh, aspects of your experience in government, uh, and the other which looks at the aspects of your experience before you came into government. So the, the first uh, is this. If you... Um, go with us. Schumacher, please. Uh, it's the witness statement, page 116. It's 5282, thank you. Uh, and now, the second sentence uh, of that says this, with, with hindsight. Sorry, no, 104.1, sorry, thank you. Uh, with hindsight, it would have been ideal to have had our own full availability of blood products. 
first mooted in the 1970s, but progress there was obviously far too slow. And then can we go to the top of the next page, please, Shumik, 105.1. Reflecting more generally and drawing on my wider experience of government, perhaps the major decision that could and should have been made was to improve the BPL facilities at an earlier stage and to remove our reliance on imported blood factors. And then you add what is obviously a sensible qualification, that you're not in a position to comment on the history of the matter. So you, you've made your views clear there, but you've ascribed in... in Paragraph 105, uh, to the, your general reflections on what had happened and the need, uh, as you now articulated, the, the desirability of having had a, a quicker um, improvement of the BPL facilities at an earlier stage. You say that drawing on your wider experience of government. Now, what is it about your wider experience of government that helps you to that conclusion? I think that as I grew more experienced in ministerial life and moved from one department to another, quite rapidly really, that I found that similar sorts of decisions, I can't bring any to mind, were dealt with rather more quickly. Uh, and, uh, and that was, I judged to some extent, because there weren't the two parallel lines, one being medical and the other being administrative and policy-making. Um, of course, in, even in the Home Office, where I dealt with a range of responsibilities, there was expert opinion amongst the officials on the streams that were relevant to whatever they were doing. I think things moved rather more quickly there. Um, I. I was in Scotland for such a short time, I can't recall much there that's relevant to that, but certainly in the Foreign Office, although, again, it was a fairly large piece of machinery in dealing with uh, people all, over, all around the world in terms of our ambassadors, high commissioners, it, 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 was, um, it was speedy. There was, a, there, was a, there was a relatively a need to produce fairly rapid reaction on policy initiatives generated through the um, communication system that we had. Thank you. The, the second um, area, as I said, draws on your, your previous experience, which was uh, a lot of it had been centred uh, not just on the military, but, uh, but also uh, on the, in the uh, aviation yes. uh, industry. Um, and the aviation industry is often said, uh, and perhaps rightly, to have had uh, an enviable safety record. Um, are there any particular lessons which, reflecting back, taking into account uh, your uh, ministerial experience, um, you think that we might learn for the future, which derive out of what happened here, as you see it, in the time in office, uh, but given the insight which you have to risk, which derives from the aviation industry? I'm not sure that I could describe anything particularly relevant to this issue. But um, in a more general way, the uh, practice in the aviation industry to describe things that might just have gone wrong but needed to be brought to other people's attention rather than let them go wrong and then have an accident became ingrained in a sort of uh, no fault, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a particular, and I'm afraid at the second, I can't remember what it was called, where people could write and say, such and such happened to me, this was very risky, I got away with it, um, what can be done to put in train something to prevent that sort of thing happening again? I think it has happened in relation to uh, issues of, with surgery. Yes. Well, if somebody makes a, a dreadful mistake for some sort of reason and gets away with it, um, it's much better to be open and describe it to people. And, and, and I have, I mean, I've made mistakes in aviation, and it astonished me when, I remember one particular one, when um, I 
got all my, other, my pilots together and said, this is what happened to me yesterday. And of course, out of the woodwork came, well, it happened to me last week, but they never said anything. Um, and so one had to handle it. But if you then blamed everybody the whole time, it was to learn from these things, not to be destructive, but to cons be constructive and say, well, OK, we've all had a fright. How do you think we can get over this in the future? And uh, I, I believe that happens within the medical world now. And I believe I've raised it at some point or other uh, in, uh, in discussion uh, in my ministerial days. Well, so you're looking for a, 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 essentially a no-blame culture, I think, is the expression. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, well, yes. I mean, if something silly happens, then maybe blame would be attached. <laughs> but if it is, if it is a, a, you know, a genuine... Um, error is made because nothing is perfect in this world and other people can learn from the mistake that you, m you either made or you nearly made, then that should be promulgated so that people are not frightened to, uh, to, to, to be honest with their colleagues about the issues. Uh, and I suppose p part of the, the essence of that is, is having information and having the transfer of information, sufficient information at the appropriate, appropriate level to the appropriate people to put things put things right or adjust the policy, whatever the policy might be. Yes, I think that's correct, Sir Brown. Yes, but thank you very much. That, that's all that I, I have to ask. Thank you very much. Lord Glenarthur, is there anything further that you would wish to add? Um, just a couple of things, if I may. I mean, first of all, I'm a great grateful to you, uh, Sir Brian, and, 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 and everybody concerned for the opportunity to contribute to this um, inquiry. Uh, and I hope that um, my evidence has helped build upon my statement. Uh, I, I would like to say that my clear recollection is that ministers during my time, whatever anybody might feel, uh, took issues on this matter extremely seriously and diligently. I have no doubt either that both clinical and administrative officials involved were thoughtful, diligent, and concerned to provide the right advice, even if the process looking back on it, all of us looking back on it, me included, often seems slow and perhaps even too bureaucratic. Everybody really was doing their best. And I re reiterate roughly the words that I used in my statement when I said that it is an enormous sadness and regret that so many were infected and others dreadfully affected by what transpired over that period. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Gunnar. Sir Brian. It's, it's a matter of, of uh, our, our gratitude to you for having come to tell us uh, what you have. It, I suspect that at times it, it must have been rather frustrating for you to, to, to sit there because you're the person who was in a position of responsibility and, and answer questions uh, when uh, so much uh, of the information you might have wished to rely on hasn't been available uh, and so much wasn't put before you. Yes. Uh, and that... Um, Although you may be frustrating for you, which was actually, I think, quite revealing for us, because it helps us to understand what someone in uh, a ministerial position uh, might face, to understand what information was and wasn't before you, before the, uh, the, the uh, CMO, um, who, a question just before uh, the, the, the break, uh, you said it might have been better if uh, perhaps... Uh, there'd been more obvious involvement by the CMO, um, put before you, put before the patients. Um, uh, and that has been uh, of great value to me in, in thinking about what, um, what conclusions are ultimately I may, uh, I may reach. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you as well for the, the way in which you've done it, because you've listened to the question uh, you have answered it on its own merits, and you must have thought quite a long time uh, uh, at times in your career over what happened. But you have given no sense of a determinedly preconceived view. You, you didn't come, if you'll excuse me, 
uh, for this reference with, with a determined line to take. Um, but you've listened to the question, you've responded to it on, on its merits, uh, and, and you've shown us both that you, as a minister you would have been prepared to be inquisitive had you been given the chance and the information to be inquisitive. You've accepted, you don't necessarily know what conclusion you'd have reached, but you've said quite fairly that you think it probably would have been the same. Um, and that's informative and useful. So I'd like to thank you for, for that. Um, and I think for coming from Scotland to to talk to us. Um, if, if that's so, and you're going back there tonight, then uh, I can tell you, um, a little aside this, that the weather up there is likely to be rather better than the weather down here over the next couple of days. So uh, there you are. Thank, thank you. Much. Thank you, Sir Brown. So uh, we reconvene on Tuesday, um, which I think is the 27th of, of July, for the evidence of, of Lord Kenneth Clark. Yes. So Tuesday, 10 a.m.